Hi, I'm Pat Farnack, and we're talking to Kenneth C. Davis today uh, about his book, In the Shadow of Liberty. Welcome. Good morning, Pat. Glad to be with you. It's a wonderful book. Uh, so many great stories, but also quite distressing, of course, because of what it's about. Well, I call it the hidden history of slavery, four presidents and five black lives, and it is the story of five people who were owned by, who were the legal property of four of our greatest presidents. It is a story that we leave out of the history books, certainly leave out of the school books, but it's too important a story as part of American history not to understand the role that slavery played in the lives of these presidents and in the early republic, and that's why I think it's really so important to understand it. It's almost like a cover-up, isn't it? We're not telling the whole story of these, these presidents. How many presidents were there who had slaves? Thirteen presidents total uh, uh, were slaveholders or grew up in a slaveholding household. Of course, four of the first five presidents, five of the first seven, they were in office for 40 of the first, nearly first 50 years of the American presidency. And this is part of the story as well, that uh, slavery was part of their political power in a sense because if you go back to the old constitutional convention and the compromises, they counted enslaved people as three-fifths of a person for determining how many seats a state had in Congress and how many electors it had. So Virginia, although it was a smaller state than Pennsylvania or Massachusetts in total population, had more enslaved people, more electors. So as I said, four of our first five presidents are slaveholders from Virginia. So uh, John Adams was not a slaveholder, nor was his son, John Quincy Adams. That's right. Those two are the only exceptions in that first generation of American presidents. And, of course, beyond the presidents, most of the uh, speakers of the House of Representatives, the Chief Justice of the mm -hmm. Supreme Court, the leaders of the Senate were slaveholders. And this was what slave power represented. We think about it as a moral issue, and certainly it was, but was principally, and the reason it becomes such such a crisis eventually. It was principally a, a question of political and financial power. In the early 19th century, slavery was America's biggest business. We don't like to say that. It's, again, it's this dirty little secret. We like to have this picture of pride and patriotism about the American past, and it tends to brush away or gloss over some of the darker side. But we can't really understand our, our past, and if we don't understand the past, understand the present without really looking at this. Interestingly, you say facts are stubborn things. Well, John Adams said that, actually, <laughs> a, a long, <laughs> long time ago, and, and I, I repeat it. It's one of my uh, favorite presidential quotes uh, uh, because th it's true. Uh, we, we, we like to say, you know, we're in an era of we're talking about fake news and things that are, uh, that are distorted, um, but if we want to really understand the past, we have to have facts. And these are facts. And one, pe one thing I must say is that people say, oh, you're just trying to tr tear down great men. And I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm very even-handed, I think, in this book in discussing men like Washington and Jefferson and Madison and not detracting from their extraordinary accomplishments. The country wouldn't exist without them, of course. But on the other hand, we have to balance the scales of history. And we can't look at Washington, the great man, the great general, the great president, without also looking at Washington, the slaveholder. It was so interesting how many contradictions these uh, guys had. Uh, talking about George Washington, I was surprised that it, among his slaves was one Ona Judge, who you talk about at length, and she escaped. She ran away, and yet it took years before she – did she ever uh, leave his mind? He always tried to recapture her try to get people to uh, take her into custody again and return her to Mount Vernon. Ona Judge is one of the five people I, I profile in this book, and that's one of the important points here is that this is a book about people. Slavery was about real people who did real things. Uh, we often reduce it to words like emancipation and proclamations and amendments, but it's a, essentially a human story. Ona Judge was this 20-year-old woman who one day in 1796 walks out of the house of the most powerful man in America, President George Washington, in Philadelphia. He spent the next three years trying to track her down, using the full powers of the presidency to do so. Um, she had left because she was told she was going to be given away as a wedding gift. 
to uh, Martha Washington's granddaughter. So again, it's the human side of this story, confronted with this, this notion that she would be given away to someone who did not have a great reputation. She decided that, that this was her moment to look for freedom. And at that time, Philadelphia was interesting because it was one of the, uh, the largest collections of free people of color in America at that time because Pennsylvania had ended slavery in 1780. Um, so this is the human side of the story. Ona Judge spent the rest of her life free, in essence, although she was still legally and technically the property of the Washington and Custis family. And if she had been caught, she would have been taken back to, uh, to, to bondage. Even though she married, she did not gain her freedom through marriage. That wasn't the way it worked. No, no. Her marriage had nothing to do with uh, with freedom. If you were born enslaved, you were enslaved for life uh, and the child of a slave. So Ona Judge, uh, born a slave herself, interesting, her father was an Englishman, uh, a tailor, an indentured servant. He actually sewed George Washington's uniform in 1775. I mean, again, the human side of the story, the connections are extraordinary. His name was Edward Judge, and he was a free person, but uh, Ona's mother was an enslaved woman, a seamstress, uh, Mrs. Washington's maid. So she was a slave for life, as her children were as well, even though their father, uh, a black man, was a free black man. They were the children of a slave. By law, they were enslaved themselves. So this is the horrific real human side of this story, this tremendous tragedy in American history, uh, and that's why I wanted to put a human face on it. One more thing I want to talk about before we get to Juneteenth, which is fascinating. Uh, during the American Revolution, the British actually offered uh, not only enslaved people but indentured servants uh, their freedom if they would leave their American owners and fight for the British. But, so this figured in uh, it was huge during the American Revolution. It was, a, it was a tremendous piece of the American Revolution, again, left out of most history books and certainly most school books. When George Washington is, uh, has the British trapped in Yorktown in October of 1781 in the final battle of the Revolution, there are uh, as many as six or 7,000 enslaved uh, fugitives who are with the British. They include 17 people from Washington's own plantation who had left when offered the chance to be free. They also include a young five-year-old boy named Isaac Granger. He later takes the name Jefferson. He's also featured in this book. Isaac Granger Jefferson is taken by the British to Yorktown and describes being there as Washington is bombarding. And then he later says, General Washington brought us back to Richmond and uh, Master Jefferson was mighty happy to see his people. Again, this human side and these connections between these people. Um, we think of you know w Jefferson in his big house in Monticello. A stone's throw from there is Mulberry Row, where the enslaved people had their cabins. Uh, Monticello is doing a very good job, by the way, of bringing that history to life. You can now see uh, what they call Hemings Cabin. Uh, a recreation of the uh, slave quarters on Mulberry Row. So we're having a reckoning about this piece of our history at places like Mount Vernon and Monticello and Montpelier, James Madison's homes, and it's a very important part of our history to acknowledge. And Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson, has that been uh, laid to rest? Well, laid to rest in the sense that it's finally accepted. Most people think that this is a story that came out recently, that historians uncovered this relationship between Thomas Jefferson and a young woman who was 30 years younger than Thomas Jefferson, by the way. Um, there's no uh, question now that Jefferson was 99.9% .9 the father of children by Sally Hemings. Um, she, by the way, was the half-sister Stay with me here a minute. The half-sister of Thomas Jefferson's wife, who had died, because they had the same father. There is even a suggestion that young Sally Hemings looked like Jefferson's dead wife, who he was very much in love with. There's no question about that. But again, it's, it's this intermixing of, of the, f the owner and the enslaved, uh, this, this bizarre relationship, very human relationship, that so often gets left out of the history books that I wanted to bring to light. Um, Isaac Jefferson, 
Isaac Granger Jefferson, who I write about in the book, actually knew Sally Hemings and offers one of the few descriptions of her, uh, hints at their relationship, but um, doesn't really confirm it. But now Monticello itself completely acknowledges that this is a fact that they are uh, one of those stubborn facts that they now completely accept after considerable controversy. Well, uh, the book is fascinating, which brings us to what is Juneteenth? We'll end with that. Well, Juneteenth is an extraordinary holiday in American history that most people have never heard of. It marks the day in 1865, June 19th, 1865, that the Union Army arrives in Texas, the farthest, most westernmost part of uh, America at the time, to inform the people of the country that, uh, that slavery has ended. And so 250,000 African Americans enslaved in Texas learn on this day that they are free. And they immediately turned it into a day of jubilee, a day of celebration. And almost a year later, the idea of Juneteenth, taking the words June and 19th, became a holiday to celebrate freedom and emancipation. It was a very, very popular holiday in the African American community uh, especially in the former Confederacy for a very long time, then sort of got forgotten as time went by. It was a day of not only thinking about the past and singing songs and enjoying it, but rodeos and barbecue and for some reason a, 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 a drink called red soda, um, uh, a combination of uh, a sparkling, you know, sparkling water and, and something red to celebrate this day of emancipation. Uh, the date has come back. Texas now acknowledges it as a state holiday. Several other states do. So it's a really a day to, that marks the, the full realization of what the Declaration of Independence is all about, that all men are created and we all have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you see it ever becoming a national holiday? I would like to see it more fully recognized and acknowledged and understood by the, by the um, general population. I don't see it being added to the, uh, the calendar, um, although I think it's, it's important that we understand what these holidays mean in our past. You know, for too long, we've had two histories, in a sense, one black, one white, separate but unequal. And I think it's time to really bring that together. The new museum in, uh, in Washington, D.C. does a wonderful job of that. But on the other hand, we just had this very disturbing moment where a noose was found in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, this chilling reminder of the deep racial scars in our past that we have to come to terms with. Uh, in America today. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us and talking about your terrific book. It's called In the Shadow of Liberty, and it's by Kenneth C. Davis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. It's a great pleasure.